So today I wanted to talk about using narrative as a tool to design user experiences and hold the mic closer to my mouth. <laughs> um, so I'm a technical program manager for Microsoft. Uh, and that might make you expect that my background is in something like computer science or engineering. It's not. Uh, I have an English degree, and that's about it, uh, which comes as a surprise to many people that I work with and many people that I meet doing events like this. Uh, but I actually find that it's a very useful perspective to have because as engineers, which I do count myself among your ranks, uh, we often miss designing experiences from the human perspective when we're first conceiving of these ideas. And so I want to talk about what comprises a great user experience. I think first it's clear. It uses concise language, which is where my English comes in. Uh, it's visually clean and with, has defined areas for separate tasks. And it, its text is always readable and readable by screen readers. In general, accessible. Uh, it's contextual, which means that it takes into account the time and the place and the intent of the user when they enter an experience. And it's familiar. So it should align with the mental models the user has already formed for that experience. And that includes mental models that they might have formed in analog experiences. So adding something to your calendar in an analog experience would be walking up to it and doodling on the box, right? Similarly, when we add an event in Outlook, we select the box for the day, we double click, and we add the event. Next, I want to talk about user profiles. So some of you may be familiar with user profiles. We use them a lot to help us walk through the experience in the shoes of somebody who is not us. This is me. Uh, I'm Ivy. I'm in my mid-20s. I'm a woman, and I work in tech. And I like to play video games and hug my cat. But often, uh, this sort of user profile is pretty basic and not really in-depth enough for us to get a good idea of what this person's experience is going to be when they are using our app. So we add common tasks. We, I, on a day-to-day -day basis, send email, and I look at code. And I Facebook message my friends pictures of said cat. <laughs> Let's walk through a scenario using this. Normally, when we walk through scenarios as engineers, we start from our perspective. So if I was uh, scheduling time in Outlook, I would describe the user experience as this. User goes to the calendar section, user double clicks, user adds event. Let's look at it from the user perspective. Oh, I skipped a slide, I apologize. <laughs> so uh, the subtleties of identity and difference get addressed as part of these user profiles. So in my case, there's another factor that is useful to know about me when you're designing experiences, which is that I have a visual impairment in my left eye. It's not correctable by my glasses, and so using technology on a day-to-day -day basis is challenging sometimes because I need the screens to be more backlit, I need text to be larger, et cetera, et cetera. And we can use the design principle of clarity to tell us how to design for everyone, not just people with visual impairments like mine. We can make sure that text is readable and screen readable, and we can make it adjustable. So that's one of the core things that we can do as designers is make things adjustable by the user for the user. Now we can talk about the scenario. <laughs> so this is my scenario. My sister's coming to town in about a month, and I'm trying to plan the trip, but it stresses me out whenever she comes and whenever I have to do this sort of planning, uh, because it actually is a very in-depth thing. And so the, I need to help her decide her travel schedule. I need to uh, plan time off work, and I need to figure out what the heck we're going to do while she's in town so that we're not just sitting in my apartment with my cat. The first thing that I do as an engineer is divide that into tasks. I need to plan time off work, decide on the travel schedule, find activities. Then I address each task one by one and break it down. 
This is how this task looks for me today. It's not so great. First, I have to check my Outlook calendar. Then I have to check my Google calendar. Then I send an email meeting to my teammates. Then I block time off on my calendar so people won't bug me during those days. And then on the day of, I have to remember to set up my automatic replies. Kind of annoying, kind of a pain. I always forget to set my automatic replies, and then I get yelled at. <laughs> let's simplify it. Instead, let's check one synced calendar. And when I block off the event, it should automatically send emails to my teammates. It should automatically block off that day so no one bothers me. And it should automatically set up my, my replies so that I don't get yelled at. Step two, deciding on the travel schedule. This is the one that I found most complex. As engineers, we don't often think about how technology that is often a one-on-one -on -one experience involves other people. For me, that's, well, I need to schedule a trip. I need to buy a ticket. But also, I need to clear all of those decisions with my sister. And I need to make sure it matches up with my own schedule. So normally, I would start by Googling the airline prices. Then I'd probably switch over to Travelocity and the airline websites. And then I'd weigh options for a while. I'd choose a ticket, and then I wouldn't buy it. I'd, I'd choose a ticket, and then I wouldn't buy it again. And then finally, I'd choose one. And then I'd forward the itinerary to my sister. Instead, be contextual. So when a user is planning a trip, there are a few things we know about them. If a user is planning a trip for somebody else, then there's another thing we know about them. Let's plan a trip while involving that other person in the decision making. So a universal app that allows both of us to make suggestions about what we're willing to put up with duration-wise, time-wise, what our days in common are, and so forth. At that point, after those recommendations have been made, we can rank our preferred choices and look at pros and cons in the app. And then I purchase the ticket. Uh, and we're both provided with our itineraries. Step three, find activities. This one's very similar to the previous one. So I Google a lot. I probably look at the stranger website, if I'm honest. Uh, I ask my friends for uh, suggestions. I pick my favorites. I send my sister the links, and then I receive her preferences, and I book the tickets. I put them on the calendar for my own sanity. This one can be an extension of what we talked about before. So you can see the familiar pizza icon. Uh, if we extend the user experience that they already went through when they were booking their ticket, they can naturally go into receiving recommendations from their friends, uh, looking at items that are free on the days that they're free, et cetera, et cetera, we can rank our choices and ultimately choose what we want to do on those days off. So how do the differences affect this? Let's go through a few user profiles and talk about it. We'll start with Sean. Sean is 64. He's a man, and he likes big hiking and photography. He bakes as a living. Uh, Commonly, he'll look up recipes and process his photos, usually of hiking. Uh, and something else you should know about him is that he has arthritis. So there are a few factors here. He's older, he's 64, so he didn't grow up with the same mental models of technology that many of us have, especially many of us in the tech industry, who ten which tends to be younger. Uh, and he has arthritis, which makes input methods that are very common for us, like typing, a little bit harder for him. There are a couple of things that we can do to address this. One of them is the familiar principle, which is even though he might not have the mental models of the technology that, he, that we do, he probably has mental models of how to address his daily tasks in an analog way. So he processes photos a lot. Well, processing photos in Photoshop is pretty similar to processing photos in real life, I guess. Is that how you want to put it? Um, you up the exposure in Photoshop just the same way you would up the exposure in a black room. For his arthritis, you know, there's not much we can do aside from 
give him some Advil, but we as designers can make an effort to include alternative input methods like touch and speech. Next, let's talk about Vani. Vani is 42, she's a woman, she's a real estate agent. She has ADHD. She likes farmer's markets and she likes cooking. Uh, her common tasks include sending email and texts and phone calls, and she uses Redfin and DocuSign daily for her, for her clients. Her challenges really come from her ADHD. She has trouble staying focused and remembering what tasks she's currently on. And we can, we can design for this person using principles of contextuality and clarity. So adding reminders and uh, giving the user one thing to do at a time allow them to work through a task one by one and stay focused. So for this sort of person, you might want to design a wizard experience. But wizard experiences are also useful to people without uh, developmental disorders. Let's talk about Rachel. Rachel is 30. She's a woman who works in retail, but she's starting her own business selling her jewelry online. Uh, she likes homemaking that jewelry, and she volunteers at the local animal shelter. Her common tasks are setting up the jewelry sales and tracking those commissions. Other factors that you might not have thought of for someone like this is that She's not super familiar with the online marketplace. She hasn't used Etsy before. She hasn't used eBay. Uh, and she only accesses her PC about twice a week, and she can only access it at the library. So she goes for long periods of time without accessing the tasks that she needs to for her business. This makes it difficult for her to pick up where she left off. And we can design for that by being contextual, familiar, and clear. We need to remind her where she left off, make sure she's updated with notifications about where she is, who she needs to be connecting with, et cetera, et cetera. And when we ask for input from her about her sales, we should be concise and clear and make recommendations based on what we, can, what we know about the business. Let's talk about Alex. Alex is non-binary, they're 27, and they're a librarian by profession. They like playing piano and knitting, and their common tasks are printing out the sheet music and patterns for their hobbies, and accessing the catalog systems from the library. They're pretty good with technology since they have to use the catalogs every day, right? But they have a really hard time finding products for them online, finding gender neutral patterns in knitting especially. And then this, this is where we need to be contextual. We always need to be inclusive and we need to assume that every product that we sell needs to be inclusive. We shouldn't sort by using identity factors. But we should maintain the sorting that they expect. She's going to have, sorry, they. They are going to have uh, very strong mental models about um, how catalogs should be organized because of their librarian job. And we need to respect that and not rewrite the wheel. Rewrite the wheel? You got me. <laughs> For project planning UI, we can add tips as well. So this is what I was talking before, where you can add contextuality, you can add suggestions for how to set up tasks, where you are in a knitting project, et cetera, et cetera. And now I just want to close by talking about what we can do to start this process. The first thing, of course, is asking our users questions. I can do my best to come up with these user profiles, and some of them have identity factors that line up with my own. But at the end of the day, I'm not my users, and I need to respect that. And so I need to ask them, when you want to complete this task, what is the first thing that you would do today if my app didn't exist? And then I can think about how to improve that. And then I can follow that up with a more general question of, if you didn't have internet, how would you solve this problem? If you needed to book a flight, how would you solve that problem? I think you can call airlines. <laughs> I don't know. I've never done it. Uh, and then 
then you can share with them the experience that you've designed and ask, what about this doesn't make sense? And don't be afraid of the critique. And there's also the question of context and just asking the user, what do you do every day with tech? Because like Alex, what they do with tech every day can vastly inform their mental model and their experience. And this applies to us as well. Even if you're only designing experiences that people in your company or even your small group are ever going to see, setting up user experiences that are inclusive and that take into account the narrative that the user brings in with them helps us to bring new people with new perspectives into to the company and design better stuff for the people outside of the company. Who has the first question? <laughs> 